need to have like a thing. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to NBA Muslims Art and Society. I see names at the bottom, so I think it's working. Alhamdulillah. All right. And so uh, we're going to get started. And our guest today is uh, uh, Nadia Muhajir. Nadia Muhajir is on the staff. She is the founder and executive director of Heart Women and Girls, a wonderful organization that I always talk about over and over again. And if you have not, visited their website, visit their website, check them out. They're wonderful. Okay. So a little bit about you, Nadia, and then we're going to get started. Nadia Mahaja is a lifelong Chicagoian, Pakistani American Muslim mother of three, public health professional, reproductive justice activist, and anti-sexual assault advocate. She's the founder and executive director of Heart Women and Girls. For the last eight years, she has led the organization to provide sexual health education and sexual violence awareness programming and advocacy to thousands of individuals, organizations, and campuses across the country. Heart was broken many cultural barriers, raising awareness and advocating for important issues such as sexual and reproductive health, sexual violence, and media literacy. Heart ultimately aims to dismantle the stigma, silence, and systems that prevent individuals from seeking information, healing, and justice. Assalamu alaikum, Nadia, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much, Layla, for having me. I think what you do is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we're actually going to be dealing with layers of all the stuff that you do because we're going to be addressing the uh, news story of, of, of Noura Hussein and also of sexual abuse in marriages, which does occur. And there is some cultural nuance to it as to whether or not people consider it abuse, uh, victimization, what happens to the victim. So we're going to start off with Nadia Mahajir, who was 16 years old when she was forced to marry her husband. And she ran away for three Nora years. Hussein, sorry. I'm sorry. What did I say? You said my name. <laughs> oh, sorry. Nora Hussein. It's live. Everyone knows it. <laughs> so Nora Hussein, she was 16 years old. She was forced to marry. Uh, I believe it was her cousin, actually. And uh, she, she escaped for three years and she was tricked to going back to him. She went back to him and she refused to have sex with him, which a Muslim wife has every right to refuse to have sex. You can try to throw up that thing about the angels and everything. Doesn't mean you have the right to have sex. It just means she may face consequences for it. And she refused to have sex. And he went and he got three of his family members, male family members, they went back and they held her down and raped her. Okay, he penetrated her, but they're still they're still rapists. Those three men are still rapists. The one that helped them because they helped facilitate uh, his penetration and they held her down. And so they left. And the next day, he went to rape her again, and she stabbed him to death. She ran to her family and they ratted her out to the police. And now she has been convicted and she is, the government of Sudan is planning to execute her because she killed her rapist when he was attempting to rape her again. Okay, so I want to get to you about that, about this whole idea of uh, marital to rape and agency. So what are some of the challenges when it comes to this whole idea of personhood? in Muslim culture when it comes to interacting intimately with another person, especially when it comes to a woman? You know, before before we delve a little bit deeper into that question, I just wanted to sort of set the tone um, because I know that some of the things that we are talking about can be triggering and can be traumatizing. And as we know, one in four women and one in six boys before the age of 18 are actually um, uh, victims of sexual uh, violence. And so I want to just make sure that the people who are listening and tuned in um, do what they need to do to take care of themselves. Um, if they need to end the conversation, please do that. If they need to reach out to us later, uh, you know, reach out to us via our website, info at heartwomenandgirls.org. Um, and if you need to talk to a professional, please do that as well. Um, these conversations can be really, really triggering. Um, but that being said, they're also very important to have. So to answer your question about, you know, what are some major challenges to Muslim women's personhood and agency? Um, so, you know, uh, there's a multiple multitudes of challenges, uh, you know, both when you look at within the Muslim community as well as outside of the Muslim community. So, you know, within the Muslim communities, uh, you know, there's this culture of nonstop religious 
and cultural shaming. You know, women are constantly told how they should be, what they should dress like, what they should look like, what kind of wife, daughter, sister, you know, professional friend they should be, um, and what is aligned with their religious tradition and what is not, right? And uh, they're constantly scrutinized and held up to literally, I feel like, unattainable standards. And there's this monolith that's, you know, promoted and upheld. And when women deviate from that monolith, the consequences of, quote unquote, that independence um, is real and sometimes can be severe. So what does that mean? So, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on some this, this month all, as well, um, you know, about our, uh, even our tradition and, and, you know, what its strengths are. And I think one of the strengths that we have in our tradition is this fact that, you know, uh, we do have this culture of uh, respecting our elders and our parents um, and and our spouses, right? There is this mutual respect that has uh, that that you know our our culture kind of uplifts um, and really valuing the advice and guidance that our parents or our elders might give us. But however, uh, we all know that sometimes a strength can actually become a weakness because it overworks and becomes detrimental, right? And yep. so oftentimes, you know, out of pressure to meet societal and cultural expectations, this can actually cause much detriment. So, for example. You know, um, the tension between parents and their children can become quite heated, especially if their children are not on board with what their parents wish for them. So in the case of Noor Hussein, uh, clearly she was not, you know, happy about this marriage and, and she was being forced to, to marry a man that she didn't want to marry. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes what happens is that, you know, many times families are able to work through these tensions either by agreeing to disagree or having compassion and respect for their child's agency. But how, you know, in cases like Noura Hussein's, sometimes this pressure that some parents feel to uphold whatever cultural or religious expectations they want for their children, it gets the better of them. And that is when their woman, uh, their, their child or a woman's agency can be threatened. And, you know, the same applies uh, to husbands who are trying to control their wives. So, so yeah, so you know that's sort of some of the stuff that's happening within our communities, uh, you know that that women face. Now, now we go to the outside community and you know the mainstream non-Muslim secular community, and our agency as women um, or our personhood can also be compromised, you know, through all the various gender Islamophobia that we experience every day, through white saviorhood, where people who think that they know better than us can tell us what to do rather than giving us control of our own decisions. Uh, you know, and just yesterday, uh, we heard, you know, that Attorney Jeff, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions decided yesterday that, you know, uh, women who are seeking asylum because they're uh, domestic violence victims, you know, they won't be receiving it anymore. That's just one example of how women are, you know, even the women who are looking to uh, escape their abusive situations are unfortunately denied that agency and freedom. And, I'll, you know, I also want to just kind of put out there this this whole idea that, you know, somehow this society is is limited or without any kind of challenges when it comes to a woman's agency and autonomy. And time and again, we see that that simply is not the case. So I, I really kind of want to clarify that because it is very, very easy to kind of set this up as kind of like, you know, feeding into the stereotype of Muslims being backwards and barbaric and everything like that. There are still forced marriages in the United States among non-Muslims. There's still child marriages in the United States among, um, uh, among non-Muslims. There's still spousal rape in the United States uh, among non-Muslims as well. And so um, I'm, I just want to kind of like reinforce that and point that out because there is like this, tend, like you said, like this whole tendency to kind of look at a, a Muslim women as victimized because of their faith, when in fact the faith actually teaches the exact opposite. And what we're seeing is, is a cultural interpretation of that faith. And you had mentioned earlier, and I kind of want to like point that out as well. You had mentioned earlier about the fact that when these men, okay, when these males decided to help the, the third male, okay, I, I don't really, I called him her husband, but I don't really don't want to because a, hus a Muslim husband just, you know, just by the mandate of a law, it should be inconceivable to do something like this, mm -hmm. but this is what happened. When they decided to go and hold this person down and, and watch 
her get sexually assaulted. There was so many things that happened in regard, and you mentioned in regards to modesty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, there's so many things that you just said here that I want to comment on. Uh, the first thing, comment is away. Just, <laughs> the first thing is just that, you know, you're right. Like it's not, uh, oftentimes, especially the mainstream media likes to promote uh, the oppression of Muslim women as a Muslim issue, as an Islamic issue, as a backwards religion, when in reality, what we're experiencing, uh, whether we're Muslim or not, as women, is patriarchy, right? A patriarchy and misogyny and this need to control and police women, whether or not they're Muslim or not. I mean, even in America, you know, you name child marriages, you, you name forced marriages, there's also all the different laws about abortion and about contraception and and you know the changing and, laws the changing laws that are that, yep. that are stripping all of women. That, that that is specifically to control a woman and her body and her bodily autonomy and her health care and her um agency to make choices about her reproductive health so i do want to make that clear that this is not a muslim issue um with res respect to what you were asking about, you know, what happened in this, in this, what we like, what we should be referring to as a gang rape, um, is the fact that there were three other men who are involved in this that were engaged in holding her down um, as, as this uh, um, incident happened. And, you know, my question to them would be is, is where was your need for modesty? at that point? Where was your need to be private about sexual affairs? I mean, we all know that in Islam, um, sex is supposed to be a very private and a very uh, intimate experience between the two partners and no one else is supposed to be involved in that. So where did their need to, to help this man uh, sort of uh, secure his quote unquote sexual rights uh, how did that supersede their need to also respect this woman's dignity and mm -hmm. and her modesty? And I think that 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 the, the hypocrisy there is just appalling um, and and quite enraging. And um, there were there were like two things that that you said. First of all, I have I have my own ideas about patriarchy. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> we could discuss that a whole other time about the whole the whole word the whole word and notion of patriarchy. And I'm not gonna sidetrack into that. But these are the same, these are the, we're talking about the same culture where women are, are, are discouraged from going to the masjid, where there are all of these walls and barriers put up consistently in public spaces to kind of, under this, this whole notion of modesty and to the point where you're not supposed to see a woman or anything like that. Where was the disconnect between that aspect of the culture and the fact that you're going to see this woman laying down with her husband on top of her inserting himself into her forcibly what is it about that that made that allowable especially when you're talking about a culture of so much gender seg segregation that occurs and you know i just think it's this, this blatant uh dehumanization and this whole idea that she's not a, a muslim woman she's not a woman this is a body. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you also pointed out there uh, are the root causes of sexual assault, right? So sexual violence is not, I mean, there's obviously it, sexual violence is, is some, an act that is committed by one individual against another, right? But there's also a whole system and culture that kind of enables and sends the messages that this is okay. And to be honest, some of the stuff that you just pointed out, like the gender segregation, like the, the curtains and not letting women into the mosques and stuff like that, they're a facade in the sense of like, people say that it's a religiously sort of uh, mandated kind of rule, but the reasoning to it is a false dichotomy, right? It's like, if you dress uh, modestly, then you will not be raped. If you don't enter the mosque, then you will not be raped. If you have, a society that is gender segregated, then you will not be raped. And all of those are false equivalent or false correlations uh, and conclusions to be made from the religious tradition that was probably made for completely different, I know for a fact was made for a completely different context. And and the interesting thing is that a lot of that, a lot of that kind of like the whole idea of rape and not only if you do, if you behave, if a woman behaves this way, then she's somehow safe from rape despite the fact that everything in this and all of the societies demonstrate that that is totally not the case. I mean, even like in, in times of war, 
the 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 instances of rapes are ratchet ratchet up uh disproport so so uh uh so much i mean you're looking at even rohingya right now a lot of children are being born as products of rape because of the the oppression that's occurring in that culture but even if you're looking at you know there's there's there seems to be also like this conversation that disconnects the idea of sexual assault and marriage meaning that once a woman becomes married somehow she loses her sec a level of her sexual agency or even all in some instances where it's a matter of if she's forced somehow that is not a thing that happens that is no such thing as forcible uh a sex sexual assault or rape once a woman becomes married yeah and i think again you're pointing out a very very important myth that um a lot of uh you know um I guess you can say like Muslim societies or communities use to sort of justify marital rape or actually dismiss or deny the fact that marital rape actually happens, right? And so, you know, just a, a real bit quick overview in Islam, it is true that both spouses are granted certain rights and responsibilities. And one of these rights is the right to sexual intercourse and sexual pleasure. Now, I think what we don't emphasize enough is that it, this right is actually mutual. It's not just the man's right. Um, it is not just the woman's right. It's actually both spouses, both partners um, have the right to sexual intercourse and sexual pleasure. And oftentimes, though, this is misinterpreted to mean that this man has unlimited uh, sexual access to his wife and that consent isn't really needed. Right. Uh, but when we also look at what the Quran and Sunnah say about marriage, how it talks about marriage, how it talks about the compassion and mercy that's been put between uh, partners and the fact that it is a mutual, you know, partnership. Uh, we know that not only does Islam value this, uh, you know, highly values this institution of marriages, but it also um, encourages and mandates both spouses to act with kindness and love and mercy with each other. So consent in, to sexual activity is very much part of the equation. You know, um, one of one of my teachers, uh, Dr. Ingrid Matson, uh, was asked this question. I was on a panel with her at the at one of the ISNA conventions, and she was asked a question about marital rape. And she put it so simply. It, you know, it took her three minutes to answer the question or less, uh, and she just put it so simply that I have to share it here, where she talked about man has a right to sex, right? Then she says, would you also make the argument that I, as a wife, have a right to financial stability, to shelter, to home, to be fed, to be taken care of? So everyone said yes. So then she said, OK, so then is it OK for me to take a bat to my husband's head or a gun to his head and say, give me my money? I deserve shelter. Um, and everyone was like, no. And so then she said, then why do people think it's OK to forcibly ask to get their sexual rights being met? And it was so such a simple um, way of putting it, but it was just it had to be said. And you know, the audience member were, were kind of like silenced by that because they were like, "Yeah, we can't argue with that." Like, Islam is also a religion of peace and not violence, and and you know, that's not a way to demand your quote unquote rights. And, and, and it's interesting that she put it that way. I would have put it this way. I just thought that if I want to have sex, do I have the right to hold a gun to my husband's head and tell him to get erect so that I can have sex? Fair it would enough. be ludicrous because um, not only misnomers that you know a man can't be sexually assaulted, he must want it. If he's erect, he must want it. That's let's just throw it out the window. That's garbage. But this whole idea that he has the right to dignity and respect and to be approached a certain way. Mm -hmm. And a woman does not, if her husband wants a certain thing from her and she's not prepared for whatever reason, for whatever reason, there could be medical reasons why she doesn't want to, he could just be a jerk mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to. It, for some reason, there's still this whole idea that she does not have the right, the, the right to the same amount of dignity and respect that the husband does. Yep, absolutely. So it's like there's just like this this subhumanness that's given to Muslim women across the board, but especially when it comes to marriage, because first of all, there's this idea that all everything that you read about, almost everything, even the scholarship itself, okay. And Habiba kind of gave a couple of good reasons why, but still, even that's not totally plausible. 
but it, the, the scholarship itself, all of the conversations that you see centers male sexual gratification. And some scholars do it in a way of teaching men how to act, okay, and how to perform sexually and to be to be to be competent sexual partners. So that's where you get like your the, that's where he's coming from. But I there's still this jargon that this messaging that runs around the the angels are going to curse you and everything like that that implies that the woman does not have the right to say no. Because even if she says no, for some reason, by alluding to the fact that the angels are cursing her because she says no, somehow justifies the man's forcing her to have sex. So they, there's no sexual equity at all going into a marriage and going into a, a, a sexual interaction as partners unless the man decides that he wants to have that equity in the partnership. Honestly, the culture doesn't teach him that. The you know, and that. yeah, and the, the, the cursing angels a hadith is actually just a really great example and something that comes up over and over and over again in the work that we do at heart. Uh, and I've gotten some really, really uh, reflective questions about it, not just about like, are the angels really gonna curse me if I don't have sex with my husband? Or uh, are the angels gonna curse me if I don't perform oral sex on my husband, right? Like they, there's all these different um, versions of this question, but then uh, the one that was, I felt the most reflective was, what if my husband refuses me? Are the angels gonna curse them, curse him, right? And and so it's just it's just pointing out the inequity and something's not sitting right with any woman who hears that that hadith because they know better. And mm -hmm. in fact, we're actually working with Karama right now. Karama is an, is is a twenty five year old institution on the East Coast um, that does a lot of Islamic scholarship around these issues. Uh, we're working with them right now. Um, asking them to do a, a research paper to look into the background and the context and go all the way back to when this hadith was revealed to really uncover what it is about this hadith and what the context was. And they have, in fact, I don't know the full details at this point because uh, we haven't received the full, um, uh, we haven't delved deep into the full research that they've done yet, but they have debunked it um, mm -hmm. as, as, as a tradition that's not strong. Um, and, and what's interesting is, is that, that Hadith is in a lot of books about marriage. Yep. I think that's a default Hadith with the Quran. Yep. <laughs> yep. And it's another way that, that, uh, that kind of demonstrates how male pleasure and male sexuality has been centered to the degree that people are scholars, uh, and people who write these books are willing to use weak and not strong, uh, traditions to justify. Mm. Uh, their positions and, and that's it's, patriarchy it's also, right there and it's also the way that they use it it's also it's also very much the way that they use it because there are a hadith where the prophet Islam talks about uh, uh gratifying your wife about it not being over until she says it's over about sending kindness before about foreplay about all of these things and those are kind of uh 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 used as just kind of like quaint hadith to encourage, uh, whereas this one is really used as, in or, uh, as a way of spiritual criminalization of the woman. Because and it's very, very oppressive because when you think about it, ultimately you as a person, regardless of gender, when you have decided to accept and practice this deen as a way of life, okay? Every aspect of your life is a form of worship to Allah. And you remember Allah every time in, in, in everything. And so when you're engaging in sexual activity, and you can do it any, there's a lot of different ways that people can engage in sexual activity, but you're purposely deciding, this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to remain within the parameters that uh, I've uh, I've come to uh, respect, in the way that I've come to respect them, in order to engage in sexual activity and gratify and gratification, 
And now that has been jeopardized. That has been jeopardized because as a sexual being, I, I, I want certain things. There are certain things that default I may want, okay? And satisfaction being one of them. But if I'm not being satisfied, if I'm not being valued, if I'm not being honored, if I'm being demeaned and degraded, if I'm not feeling loved, I don't want to perform as a sexual being. Or but treated you, like an animal. Or treated like an animal. I don't want to perform as a sexual being. And this hadith, the way that this hadith is utilized is that, so what? That doesn't matter. God wants you to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, despite the fact that you don't feel, you, you're being treated like an animal, you don't feel love, you don't feel desire and arousal for this person, okay? For whatever reason, God still wants you to do it. If not, you're cursed. Mm -hmm. You're cursed. You're a bad, bad, bad Muslim because you don't want to have sex or at least force yourself to let this person do whatever they want to do. And, and, and the sad thing about it is that it reinforces the dysfunction because then you're forced to do it and none of the problems get solved, okay? Your partner doesn't know, learn how to treat you so that you do want to do it. Yeah. And you know, I mean, uh, it also brings up the, the point about, you know, if you have this hadith that is literally shoved down your throats a as a child, right? And you hear it like throughout your life, then is informed consent even something that one can engage in, right? Because now it's like, even there's this mental gymnastics that people will be playing in their heads like, oh, my husband wants to have sex, but I don't want to because I have a headache or I had a sleepless night because of the kids or I'm just really exhausted or I'm not, I'm feeling sick to my stomach, but I might as well do it because otherwise I'm gonna be cursed and God said so. And like, there's no informed consent there at that point. It's mm -hmm. like literally an act of guilt that you are engaging in rather than an act of mutual pleasure or um, you know something that both partners want to engage in. You know, I never thought about, I, I, I always thought of it as a form of spiritual coercion. And, 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 and it definitely does extend the violence to your spirituality, which is just so criminal in and of itself. Because even after that act, even after that act, your mind, now in your mind, God has forced you mm -hmm. to have, Allah has forced you to have sex with this person, okay? So what does that say about me and my relationship with my Lord? What does that say about how my Lord considers me as his servant and as a human being? Am I, in fact, a human being in the eyes of my Lord? And, 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 the, and the disturbing thing is that so much scholarship reinforces this. I, I've been Muslim for 30 years, and I just, just read anything from Muslim scholarship that said that talked about female gratification and 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 better yet actually frames okay male sexual encompassing in a bad light mm -hmm. okay so it's just like it was it's 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 it frame it as something that is a bad characteristic to have is to not be a good lover if you're a man is to not be a good lover so it's talking about thirty years of of, of not only women being forced into this idea that they have to perform sexually no matter what, okay, but also this idea that the men don't have to, and it's okay, it's all right, you know? And there are plenty of, I've, 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 I've been approached about the fact of the, hu the husband not performing properly, not and underperforming. And, and and having a low libido when she doesn't ha when she doesn't have a low libido, and so what happens? That you're supposed to surround with understanding and everything like that. He could not just feel like it. He could actually just decide. You know, I'm just going to be very very spiritual, and that's a whole other thing. Removing faith and intimacy, alienating the two. But I'm going to decide to be very very spiritual, and I really don't want to have sex with you. I'm going to spend all night zickering every single night. And it doesn't care how badly you're burning as a sexual human being. I don't want to do it. And a wife is supposed to understand that. Mm -hmm. But if, if the roles are reversed, then the angels are cursing you. Yep. And I, and I do want to point that out. I mean, like we always talk about sex, you know, in a very heteronormative way where it's the man needing the sex and the woman just having to, you know, sort of oblige. But oftentimes 
the in the in the stories that we've heard and collected and you know supported women through oftentimes it's often the opposite where the woman really just wants to have sex and the husband is not obliging or not mm -hmm. or using it as a as a tool to control her or using it as a, a bribing negotiating tool however you want to say it but it, there's not a, a healthy sexual relationship there either where it's the woman who's always you know uh sexually deprived and the man just kind of you know high and mighty just says well you know i'm just doing other things like working or or uh uh, uh uh, worship or, you know, whatever it is that I need to do. And or are you suffering you know, from erectile dysfunction? <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, if, 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 if I've had a lot of women come to me about, about like my husband doesn't want to have sex with me. There's only like five possibilities there, right? You know, <laughs> it's erectile dysfunction. It's uh, perhaps they're a victim of sexual trauma themselves and they need to work through that. Right. Um, unfortunately, there might be infidelity there, right? There might be something to consider there. There might be sexual orientation that they might be struggling with. There might be um, asexuality. Um, yeah. Porn addiction. Porn addiction is really real. And it, it actually results in um, the, the person not being able to perform in real life situations, right? So there's only a handful of possibilities, all yeah. of which that can be worked through. And a major one, and a major one is that they have been trained in this society to see sex as a certain thing in a certain way, okay, and to be approached a certain way by both partners. And she scared him. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. He can't she handle a woman him. who's initiating. He can't handle a woman that's initiating. He can't handle a woman that is sexually competent. And he can't handle a woman that's sexually adventurous. I mean, that that could a partner that's taught a certain way, a certain things about sex. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslim cultures are, are very puritanical about sex. Given not only the the scholarship, but also the literature that that Muslims have produced about about uh, about sensuality, I, I find it hard to believe. But a lot of Muslim societies, modern Muslim societies are very puritanical about sex. And as there's a shift in that, you know, they just may be scared. I've, I've encountered that too, where I, I, I'm talking to uh, uh, women and they want certain things from their partner and their partner completely shuts down. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely, not only at that moment, but doesn't want to have sex anymore at that time. And so what do you do? But you're supposed to understand all of that. Oh, well, you scared him. Okay. You got to lighten it up. You're too, you're too much for him. You got to lighten up and you got to understand. You have to wait for him to decide to have sex with you where the, a woman is not given that option. And there's nothing uh, uh, about the faith itself that indicates that that is what's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, and I mean, and this is kind of going on a tangent, but um, similarly, Let's go. I'll ride right with you. <laughs> similarly, I mean, there's there's that whole um, again hadith, which I question how strong or weak it is about how a man has a right to offspring, and so he can divorce his wife if she is uh, unable to give him children. Right. So let's reverse the roles here. We have modern technology, and oftentimes couples who are struggling with fertility, infertility rather. Um, discover that it's not the woman, but it's the man. So now does she have the right to also divorce? Um, oh, you have because to understand. You have to understand. You have to understand. And you're, you, you're more pious if you accept the fact that he, that he can't, can't give you children. children. You're more pious if you accept the fact that he can't gratify you sexually, that he probably will never get to that point of really, really satisfying you as a sexual human being. Time and again, women making compromises in the partnership is directly related to their level of piety. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. And where it's not the same for men. It it's absolutely different. even the same in abusive situations where I have heard um, so many imams and scholars actually advise women who have sought counsel and said, I, my husband is beating me up every night or my husband is X, Y, and Z. And they have said, you know, you do have the option to leave, but you will be granted heaven if you stay. So it is best if you Are you leave. serious? I have heard this over and over again, over and over again, that the true test is the one who actually, you know, and, and just just really 
endangering them and endangering their children, if there's any children involved, and anybody who's around them. And I think that's a, that's doing a really big disservice to women to not, you know, I understand, uh, you know, wanting to protect uh, the nuclear family and all, I understand all of that, but not at the expense of somebody's safety. But what are you protecting? You know, what are you protecting? If there is a, a, a dysfunction and violence in the, in the, in the union, what union are you protecting? Yeah, absolutely. And it's been shown, it's been shown time and again that, that it all, that violence and dysfunction always increases if it's not dealt with. So you saying to a victim, okay, well, you're going to get heaven if you uh, endure your abuse, okay? The only thing you're doing is making sure that they get, they, they get there faster, mm -hmm. okay? Because endurance of abuse without it being effectively addressed all, almost time and again escalates further and further. Just like sexual dysfunction gets worse and worse, okay, over time because you don't have, um, you, you, you haven't rectified it. And, okay. and let's, let's, let's also reframe it. Like, couldn't you also make the argument that one would actually be rewarded for leaving an abusive situation because they are prioritizing their safety and their children's safety? I mean, you could also kind of flip it on its head and say, you know, but I'm also protecting my children from having to witness this their entire life and mm -hmm. possibly replicate it in their marriages because that's all they know, right? So breaking the cycle could also be something that one could be rewarded with if you want to take that spiritual angle. And, and, the, th and the thing about the, this is the thing about the spiritual angle. This is the thing about the spiritual angle because these are people in leadership and, and, and religious uh, leadership positions that saying this nonsense. And that's what it is. It's just basic nonsense because we see in the dean itself that abuse in any form is not was not tolerated by the Prophet of Islam. It's not something that Allah dictates. It's actually the opposite of, of, of the teaching. And so, but just by virtue of the fact that you're in this uh, spiritual religious uh, leadership position and you're saying that you need, you should endure this violence against you when the Prophet Islam said a Muslim is one whose uh, other Muslims are safe from their hands and their tongue, okay? But I'm telling you, you need to get beat in the head. Just keep on enduring that, all right? That right there is one of the main things that's wrong with Muslim leadership today, mm -hmm. is that you don this garb of piety and religious knowledge and you wear the turbans and you wear the suits and everything like that. You can you can you can uh, spout out the Quran in Arabic so fluently and everything like that. And yet, and still, you're telling someone that you're connecting their faith and their piety and their taqwa to the same violence that Allah and His Messenger condemned. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge disservice. To first of all, you need to be afraid of Allah. Because you're gonna be faced with all of that because you sending that person back. You yeah. sending that person back and they get hurt, they get killed, every bruise that they get, every tear that they cry, and, and, and every time they gotta go to the hospital and everything like that. That's on you. But also you're feeding into the cycle because those kids see that happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're feeding into this pattern of abuse. And what you're doing is you're feeding this culture of violence in Muslim culture when Islam teaches you not to. So that right there is one of the biggest problems with scholarship and they need to really, really, really work at fixing that. So I just wanna roll back one more time to this whole idea of, uh, cause we're almost halfway through, we're almost over and I wanna get you out in time cause you're very busy and I, I really appreciate you um, taking the time out to this. So now I wanna roll back. I wanna get to the sexual trauma aspect of it. Because what happened to Noor Hussein, okay, she faced a subsequent rape and she stabbed the man to death, okay? Her other rapist, her other three rapists, okay, she has four men rape her. She killed one who tried to rape her again. So she has three rapists out there running around scot free. They escaped any kind of crimin criminal uh, prosecution or anything like that. She was the one that was criminalized. And so I want to get back to that, the whole idea of what happens to a, a victim 
of sexual trauma because we already established that yes you can force your wife to you can you can uh, rape your wife yes you can sexually abuse your wife she does not lose the right to say no to you just because she became your wife so you force her you're a rapist you're 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 engaged in a sexual abuse so now after that trauma happens okay and the victim is uh what are some of the things that the victim may go through after that trauma occurs? You know, uh, so many different things. Uh, trauma it can manifest in so many different ways and it can also last for like five minutes. It can last for a lifetime, right? And mm -hmm. it just depends on each individual person. That's what makes trauma so complicated and difficult to uh, uh, treat because it is so unique to each individual and and their entire lived experience and the messages that they've gotten their entire life and what triggers them and what doesn't trigger them and all of that. So, you know, um, so many things can impact one's ability uh, to deal with trauma, whether or not they have family support, whether or not they're believed about the trauma, dismissed, seen, heard, um, you know, asked, how can we help? Whether or not they're seeking professional help, uh, you know, some, you know, may actually want to be around community or their family or you know whatever, while others might find that uh, equally as triggering or suffocating, right? Especially if those same people were the ones who are silencing them or um, dismissing their um, experience. Uh, you know, the impact of trauma can uh, manifest in physical, emotional, social ways. So um, I have, I, I, I've worked with survivors that have told me that their trauma manifests purely physically. So they deal with excruciating migraines. They deal with excruciating stomach pains. I have other um, survivors that have told me that it actually, uh, uh, you know, added to their um, inability to be intimate with their with their partners once they were in a in a consensual relationship. That it sort of stopped them from wanting to be able to have sex or engage in sex in a way that was pleasurable. Um, it, you know, obviously it can stop you from, uh, emotionally. Uh, it could cause a lot of depression, suicidal ideation. Um, a lot of survivors, the statistics show that they're actually more likely to engage in risky behavior um, as a result. So drug abuse, alcohol, uh, alcohol abuse, smoking, um, cutting oneself, eating disorders, um, all of those kinds of risky behaviors. Um, they're even more at a likelihood if they don't get the professional help that they're looking for. So, I mean, trauma, it, like I said, it's very unique. Uh, other times, you know, uh, there might be a survivor or a victim that will get assaulted and they'll just get up and just walk and go to school the next day or go to work the next day and maybe not even think about it until six months later, eight months later, 10 months later, a year later, right? And, and now if we're talking about children victims, it's even more complicated because oftentimes children don't even know what's happening to them and literal years can pass by before they actually connect the dots and they recognize that what ha what happened to them when they were five was actually violence. And when when that actually does occur, okay, so say it, it, it may be immediate, you say it may happen further down the line. When a situation occurs where the survivor, okay, may feel that threat again, or may be going through uh, uh, processing that trauma at, the t at, at that particular time, whether it's immediate, whether it's the next day, whether it's years later. Um, what can society, what can people expect from the, the can, can, do people, should people expect a certain level of rationality from the survivor at that time? Meaning, mm -hmm. I mean, again, it, it, it varies survivor to survivor, right? But like oftentimes what we hear is, you know, there's a case, uh, like, you know, let's say there's a public case that's in the court systems right now. And one of the first lines of defense are, that the defense will use is, well, your story differs to the victim. They'll say, how come you said that he was wearing a red shirt at the time of the assault and now you're telling me that they were wearing a blue shirt? Or uh, why are you telling me that it happened at three in the afternoon when now... Uh, you know, it's showing like it was more like noon, right? And and they'll try to use those discrepancies in their story to sort of uh, discredit the the victim and and sort of paint them as a liar. Um, but what's in reality, what's happening is, uh, you know, PTSD, post traumatic stress, stress disorder, is real. And oftentimes, if somebody's being assaulted, uh, sometimes they freeze. 
and sometimes they go numb and sometimes, you know, uh, they just go into shock and they don't, and you know, like the whole um, common, how come you didn't fight back? How come you didn't scream? All of that is a trauma response. And you know, a lot of survivors have shared with me, I didn't fight back, I didn't scream because I didn't wanna die, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and I don't think people really understand what the trauma of sexual assault can feel yeah. like or, or what it can do to someone. And so, you know, after an assault, you may actually um, see the victim engaging in irrational behavior, irrational anger, irrational emotions. They might laugh uncontrollably, right? They might cry uncontrollably. They might have a story that doesn't really connect um, in terms of the puzzle pieces. And, you know, that's all something that we should expect and 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 see as normal as part of being a victim and not something as immediately, oh, that person's lying. That assault never happened because yeah. their story doesn't check out. Well, I mean, because nor stabbed her assaulter okay she defended she 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 defended herself and she stabbed him and he's dead and um one of the things one of the questions that that being that's been brought up is well why didn't she go to the police okay mm -hmm. let's leave alone the fact that you're you're suggesting she goes to the police in a, a, a in a criminal justice system that doesn't even recognize yep. because she's a wife <laughs> and she can get assaulted let's leave that alone but let's the whole idea that at that time, at that moment, or even afterwards, because you know I was the victim of sexual abuse in di in different stages of my life, from the time that I was a child up until uh, before I became Muslim. And I, right now, if I saw my assaulters right now, I don't know how violently I would react. I'm just being honest, okay? And that whole idea of well, why did you fight back? You, you know, you can freeze up. I froze up every single time. Mm -hmm. There was no fighting back. And so it's like at that time, at that moment, when that's happening and when you're processing that trauma, okay, is it fair for society to turn around and expect you to behave and to respond the same, as, the same way as someone that has not been subjected to similar trauma? I mean, and I mean, let's let's go back to the why didn't she go to the police, right? I mean, there's so many reasons, uh, including the one that you pointed out that she lives in a in a government that won't even recognize her her situation as assault, right? So that's the first thing. But second thing, there are so many reasons why people don't go to the police or even disclose to their family. Uh, and the number one reason is they won't be believed. They will be ridiculed. They will be silenced. They will be told they imagined it. They will be told that, are you sure that really happened by that? Are you sure that that is they the person? They faced with more violence by people that they tell. They will be blamed, right? Um, and, you know, and so I feel like uh, why you didn't go to the police, uh, why she didn't go to the police is, is, you know, that's one of the number one reasons she was probably fearing being blamed, not believed. And like oftentimes, and this happens in America just as much as it happens, you know, globally, oftentimes victims go to the police and and even the police don't believe them. And even the police blame them and say, you know, I mean, I know I have a friend in the United States of America who was assaulted, you know, in you know, one of the biggest cities in this country. And she went to the police and they still said, why are you standing before us? Maybe we should be arresting you, right? Mm -hmm. And and so if you, if you live in a world where those who are meant to protect you clearly miss the mark every single time, and you live in a world where you know that, maybe not with yourself because maybe this is your first time being assaulted, but you've seen all of your peers and all of the cousins and sisters and, and brothers and everyone who has gone to the police been turned away or been silenced or been blamed or interrogated to a degree where they too have been dehumanized, why would you go to the police? And that, and also, also, you're trained, okay, by the culture, by the society, all right, that you don't have the right to. But mm -hmm. so even though there, you know, spousal uh, 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 rape laws do exist in the United States now, then they, they just they just started they just started with that. Considering how old the country is, you know, within the last sixty years, you know, um, you're still fed the message. In is in Muslim cultures, and I say Islam, Islam doesn't say in Muslim cultures in the United States that you 
as a wife, don't have the right to say no. You don't have the right to say no. It's not something that's coming in from, you know, oh, this just happens in immigrant Muslim populations. That was something I was very much trained, okay? When I uh, uh, became Muslim, that was one of the things. The four wife thing was the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. But I'm just saying, like, that was one of the things. You know, uh, he can have more than one wife, and he, you have to be, uh, devoutly ob obedient to him, submissive to him, and you can't say no to him. The angels will curse you, and he's not forcing you. It's not rape if he if he has to force you a little bit. This is in Muslim cultures in the United States. So now that being said, if I as a victim, because you don't want the abuse to continue, you don't. You're talking about a human being that's being abused. Primarily, you don't want the abuse to continue. And when the abuse presents itself again, Muslims have sent you the message with some scholarships, imams, all of that. The culture has sent you the message that he can do this. We're not going to say anything. If he does it again, we're not going to say anything. And here it comes again. So, you know, if you get stabbed, all right, this is a person that's been traumatized and the trauma is presenting itself again. Okay. What? The Muslim society has left victims with no other recourse but to 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 feed to, to that that basic basic primal uh, uh, response to not wanting the abuse to continue. How can you blame victims for that when your messaging is that, especially wives? Okay, when your messaging is that he can do this to you, we're not going to do anything if he does this to you. Well, and I would. It is a little you know, I wouldn't even, yeah, I mean, I would just frame it as it was, uh, to me, it was an act of uh, pure and simple self-defense, pure and simple. I mean, oftentimes the other thing that we do, right, is when we talk about sexual assault prevention, we're like, oh, we should have all these uh, self-defense classes. We should teach women how to, you know, defend themselves and carry mace and all of like, right? So we're actually wanting women to defend themselves when such violence occurs. So first of all, let's talk about the practicality of that. Oftentimes, it doesn't matter if you're black belt in self-defense. If you're being assaulted, your body, you don't know how your body's gonna re respond. And it can actually respond in a way that freezes and you forget all your black belt um, sort of um, uh, skills, right? But that being said, we live in a society that's sending double messages. On the one hand, it's, you know, get all the, get all the, um, the self-defense training, carry the mace, defend yourself. When somebody attacks you, defend yourself uh, until that person's your husband. And mm -hmm. then you cannot defend yourself. You cannot defend I, yourself. So for me, I, I don't think of her reaction to him as primal. I don't even think about, mm -hmm. I don't I don't think about it as like, oh, poor woman didn't have any other option. It was literally in the moment. She is going to, just like you said, she is about to be assaulted again. And she just wants this situation to end. Yeah. And whatever well, way... It I, it I, I just meant that because of the messaging that the society sends to why Muslim society sends to Muslim wives in particular, mm -hmm. that's all you're left with. That's mm -hmm. what you're left with. Okay. And even if you had the other, the, the, the other systems of support in place, there still may be a violent reaction because mm -hmm. that's what happens when you assault someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, there's no contextualization to someone defending themselves. There's no contextualization to uh, or caveat to someone being abusive or someone assaulting another person. If I, as a human being, if you can't assault me when I'm standing in the street, if you can't assault me when I'm in public spheres, if you can't assault me when I'm not your wife, what makes you think that you can assault me mm -hmm. when, when you are, when I am your wife? I'm still the same person. I'm still the same human being. The Hadith does not say, say from their hands and their tongues unless they're married. Because then if they're married, they're all bets are off. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he could do and say whatever it is he wants. Okay. Where's the idol in that? Where's the justice in that? So you're putting something on Alana's messenger that simply is not there. Okay. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you're still talking about a human being being subject to violence and 
either not resisting or resisting that violence. And when they resist that violence, it can come any way, shape, or form. So if you're sending men into these marriages with this idea that somehow we've coerced them, we've used the religion enough to coerce them into submitting to you a certain way, okay, when they don't, when they respond just like they would respond if it's Joe Blow on the street trying to be violent against them, how can how can you blame them at that point? Mm-hmm. How can you blame them at that point? And how can men be upset? And how can how can Muslim culture be upset? And how can family members send call the police and and, and just sit back there and watch this person be victimized again and life put in jeopardy when all they did was try to stop? the violence. Mm-hmm. Why how does that shift happen? How does that disconnect happen? How does that how does that dehumanization happen? How is it that I as a Muslim woman am, am human in this context, but not human in another context? And that does not happen to men. That does not happen to men. Where's the example of Muslim men where well, you're human in this context, but you're not human in that context. Okay. So that's the thing that is like feeding into this culture that is allowing all of this, all of this violence and trauma to continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you. I'm getting you out on time. (laughs) I mean, if if you, we can, we, uh, we have, we can talk so. So if you want to talk so. I, I, I I would, oh, I can talk more. Cause I kind of like work through stuff. Come on girl. I was trying to get you out in time. (laughs) I did. I did. I wanted to get you out in time. Uh, Um, Hold on one second. I'm going to go back to my things now. So see, now you messed me up because I'll go back to my things. Okay. All right. So listen, since we have a little time left, can, and I know we're kind of back ending this, but can we just kind of like reinforce this, 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 this definition of what sexual abuse is? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the way that we like to define sexual violence, we like to um, actually define it as a very umbrella term. Um, and so sexual violence is on all unwanted sexual acts, whether we're talking about harassment, right? Harassment is like things like um, uh, uh, stalking and uh, sending people explicit uh, text messages that they don't wanna, um, you know, or bullying them, intimidating them. Um, whether we're talking about harassment, whether we're talking about abuse or whether we're talking about assault. So assault is, you know, a full on penetration, Um, and rape and things like that. Abuse is, you know, um, uh, there's generally a power differential involved. So a child and an adult or a doctor and a patient, teacher and a student, um, you know, uh, that can range from, you know, uh, just uh, touching um, or molestation to actual rape. Uh, So whether, so all unwanted sexual uh, acts, whether we're talking about harassment, abuse or assault committed against the another person without that person's freely given consent is sexual assault and could be considered a crime. Um, And we'll talk about United States law, obviously, under the United States law, but also globally could be considered a crime depending on what it is. Now, I wanna wanna touch on that power dynamic thing because um, do you think because of the, the, the utilization of certain messaging to Muslim women about their their, their loss of agency and um, being coerced, using their religion to coerce them into acts. Uh, 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 uh. Is, there, is there a power dynamic that exists between a husband and a spouse through that, that consistently compromises the wife's ability to uh, say yes or no, or kind of just kind of decide either way? You know, I don't want to say consistently because, you okay. know, that's painting that's painting um, partnership and marriage as a very one sided thing. Right. So I don't I, I want to acknowledge that there are very healthy marriages and healthy relationships out there and and men who really understand consent and boundaries and women who really understand consent and boundaries. Right. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. But the power dynamic, I mean, it, you know, obvi- uh, in a lot of marriages, when when there are abusive situations, you know, either the either spouse. I mean, let's also acknowledge that a woman, a, a, a wife, can abuse her husband as well. But either spouse, you know, uh, assumes that they're better than the other, and assumes that they can actually sort of uh, 
exert this power and they they do it in variety of ways you know there's financial um abuse where they control how you spend money uh, or like scrutinize a credit card bill there's uh using isolation so controlling uh whether or not you get to see your friends or family or or how often you get to see them uh controlling your text messages uh and things like that and then of course there's you know using sex as as a method of uh control over somebody else using uh physical uh a strength as a control over somebody else and then of course emotional um abuse as well so so bullying them talking down to them and all of these intersect obviously especially when you're talking about an abusive marriage uh oftentimes if one kind of abuse is present all, like a lot of the others are also present as well mm -hmm. and then of course you know it gets even more dangerous when you're talking about communities of color and, and immigrant communities because if one spouse has um legal status and the other spouse does not then mm -hmm. that could also be used uh to threaten them so you're not going to go to the police uh because you'll just be deported do you really want to report me or if the spouse, if one spouse has uh, it has a criminal record, mm -hmm. and the one other one doesn't have a, a criminal record as well, I'm 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 thinking along the lines of, of of how we're trained to consider intimacy in a Muslim marriage, and this whole idea of men asserting their rights. So if a wife says no, he's den she's denying him his rights. Okay, where and w Muslim women aren't generally encouraged to think of their sexual gratification as a right, despite the fact that there are, the, the, it, the Islamic teachings do indicate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm thinking about the, the power dynamics that's set up by the culture itself. So even though it may not play out in individual marriages, is there like this consistent power dynamic in, even in those mm -hmm. marriages, even in the marriages where the, each spouse respects their the other as a partner and a sexual partner as well. And I broadcast. Oh, I, oh, because I only said it for an hour. <laughs> it did. Oh no, it didn't end yet. Okay. Oh, it's but, still live. It this says is my it's still first live. time. This is my first time. So it's like <laughs> so each partner respects the other one. And there's sexual equity. All right. It very much seems to me, it's been my observation, that that is a luck of the draw for a woman. The luck of the draw for the woman, the Muslim woman is that you marry this man, okay? And, you know, wow, alhamdulillah, he isn't running around acting like he has to micromanage you and dictate everything, everything. Oh, wow, he actually wants you to be sexually gratified. Oh, wow, he's all right with walking away if you say that you're not in the mood. Mm -hmm. That just seems like the luck of the draw that you <laughs> That you end up with that. But it seems like Muslim culture has definitely set it up so that the wife is, is not a luck of the draw to have a wife who is sexually available. Whether or not she wants to be, she is sexually available. But for the wife to feel like she doesn't that she doesn't have that she could say no is really about the man, the husband himself kind of deciding, yeah, that's that's I'm not down with that. I'm not down with forcing my wife to do that. I'm not down. I'm. Not, I really don't want to have sex with someone unless they want to have sex with me. You know, I agree. that's yeah. the luck of the draw. I I totally agree with you, and I think this goes back to uh, in the beginning when I shared about some of the challenges that women face within Muslim communities. I focused on you know um, this this dynamic of parent child uh, respect, right? And that like you know. Uh, you should respect what your your mom or dad wants for you and you should obey, right? But there's also a culture that sort of transfers that level of respect from the obedience to the father to obedience to the husband, right? And, and I think that that is uh, where the power dynamic can come up and where that can be abused. It's like, I am your husband. You must, you know, you must... Uh, respect me and you must ob uh, obey me right and and actually that's a really that's a really interesting example because one of the women that we supported who came to us about with the opposite situation where my husband doesn't want to have sex with me what do i do uh, that was actually his reason he kept saying well you don't respect me so i can't have sex with you right and mm -hmm. and so then she would go through great to gr through to great lengths to respect him and to show that she loved him and to show that you know um, she honored his his uh, sort of uh, 
uh, stance. He stroked his ego. Exactly. And, (laughs) and he still didn't want to do it. And so, and so, you know, I think that's an example of how those uh, gender stereotypes and that, that uh, unequal um, emphasis on one, uh, mostly the man needing the respect and not the woman and it not, it not becoming about mutual respect. That's what happens when, when those kinds, when abuse happens. But in, you know, if, if it's, if this mutual respect is actually emphasized and taught and ingrained in mm-hmm. children as, mm-hmm. as young as three, then you're looking at a, of a more respectful partnership. And also uh, just to really kind of like get rid of a lot of the generals, a lot of the stereotypes that men are fed about women. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, 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 I kind of got like a door opened up for me when I started talking to Habiba Kande because he's very, very honest <laughs> about the conversations that men have. And there's a lot of garbage <laughs> That they're fed <laughs> that's going out there. And, you know, I feel torn sometimes because sometimes I'm like, part of me is just like angry and, and irritated. And the other part of me kind of feels sorry for them because it's like, they really taught you this, <laughs> this, 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 this insanity. And so one of them is like this whole, uh, no, I think that some of it may be, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the inability to deal with a reject th- that immediate rejection from the wife okay uh that because you're told that she not only is it this general idea throughout society so it's not like something that's confined to muslim men men period that they always want it a woman always wants it she always wants it she always wants you she wants you 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 see that woman there yeah she wants you too and that one too and you see the woman with the walker wobbling down the street she wants you as well so when a woman says no, and they don't want you, and maybe they don't want you, period, they don't want you at that particular moment, whatever, she has said no, that does something to the male ego. Mm-hmm. And if you're fed this whole idea that you have a right to it, and you can pressure into it, and you can force her into it, which that's, that's toxic rape culture right there, then this dysfunction is going to occur. You can't deal with the rejection. Not, mm-hmm. whether it's immediate or complete, okay? Mm-hmm. And so then the dysfunction and the violence gets ratcheted up at that point. So Muslim men, men in general, okay? But I'm thinking about my brothers because their akhir is being <laughs> jeopardized here. Your akhir is being jeopardized if you're causing this pain and suffering to one of Allah's creation because ultimately that's what your wife is. She is Allah's creator. She's Allah's creation. She's a servant of Allah, you know? And there's even a hadith where the Prophet Islam specifically said, Allah said, do not keep his female servants. Okay, meaning ultimately she is his and you're causing this violence and abuse on Allah's servant. So that's your akhirah right there in jeopardy and don't think it is not. So it's like, there needs to be this training on how to be not only a competent sexual being, but also how to think about women and humanize women in the sexual exchange. And I just think that overall in Muslim culture, despite the teaching, otherwise, that's something that's not done. Women, men are not trained to see women as sexual human beings. Mm-hmm. Women are not trained to see themselves Them as sexual themselves, human beings. Absolutely. And not to mention, I mean, you brought up something about uh, rejection. And this, and, and this, I don't think this is just specific to Muslim men. I think this is just men in general. Um, you know, especially after the the latest shooting that happened in Texas, um, I don't remember the uh, oh the uh, girl when she uh, he shot her because yeah. she said uh, she rejected him on a date or whatever. Yeah. She wouldn't go um, to prom with him or something. I think. Yeah, and that and is- that and that that generated a conversation about like we need to teach boys how to comprehend and accept no, mm-hmm. right? Um, in a way that is that is uh, healthy, and in a way that, of course, you know, it's disappointing if somebody refuses you to go to prom or even refuses to have sex with you. It's disappointing, of course, if 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 that's what your desire, you know, if you really really desired it, uh, and you're re- quote unquote rejected, it's disappointing. But uh, we really really need to work with boys on understanding and respecting what happens when they are declined. Uh, and that, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, 
there might be a personal reason and there might not be a personal reason, right? But like whether or not you choose to take it personally and you know, you could be sad about it, you could be depressed about it, but that does not give you license to actually um, engage in violence like like this, this unfortunate man did. And, and even, I mean, even not even like that level of violence, there even, there's even subtle ways that you become violent towards a person, you assault a person, okay? And, and when, when they're rejected, when you're rejected, you could verbally assault them. So, you know, you were all into her and everything like that. And then she said, no. And this happens in marriages too. Okay, this happens in marriages too. And all of a sudden she says no. And all of a sudden the verbal abuse starts to get piled on. Okay, all of a sudden things are not cool anymore. All of a sudden the house becomes very, very tense. All because at that moment she said no. And it's a vicious cycle. Because guess what? If you're a jerk, and I'm saying this to Muslims in general, but men in particular, okay, if you are a jerk at Fajr to your wife, she's going to remember it, <laughs> okay, the whole yeah. day. She's, and, 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 the pro, and the Prophet only so warned you about that. He warned you about it. He said, said some good before, okay? Before you even think about what's down there, you better be thinking about her being ready to accept it. And so you have to think of something good before. So if you're a jerk at Fajr, she's going to remember it all that day. And if you don't do anything to rectify it, when you decide to approach her, she's going to say no. Mm -hmm. And she's good. And she can say no. Just like you can say no, she can say no. Mm -hmm. Okay. And instead of trying to pull out a hadith about angels and getting cursed and everything like that, <laughs> because honestly, that's not romantic at all. And that's not turning anyone on. All right. Instead of doing that, learn how to rectify it. Learn how to rectify whatever it is that you need to do so that she wants you. And that's 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 the the the, the lowest level. Because of course there are, are obviously other reasons, there are medical reasons why uh, a partner may not want to engage in sexual activity and things like that. I'm just talking about like a general, you've been a jerk, stop being a jerk, be nice. Okay, and maybe she'll want you mm -hmm. because the hadith is not working. All right, I, I've never told my child, my daughter that hadith. I've mm -hmm. never, I've never told my sons that hadith. They've heard it other places. Okay, I don't want my daughters to think that their Lord and Creator prioritizes a man's sexual gratification over their humanity. Okay, period. Mm -hmm. And 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 that is what should be taught as well, because Muslim women are not. I can't imagine from the time that you were little being fed this nonsense. OK, I was 18. All right. So I had, I had my own notions and ideas about sex already developed at the time. And I still had issues with grappling with what was being said to me. I can't imagine from the time that you're young that you're fed, that you're not, you're subhuman. You're subhuman sexually. And you need to prioritize this other person simply by virtue of the fact that he's a man and he's married to you. I, I, I find that just utterly, not only utterly preposterous, but just so, so violent to do to, to Muslim women. And so it's such a disservice to Muslim communities because there can be functional relationships, functional sexual relationships. We have the teachings to do it. Uh, we have an ex example in our, in our beloved Prophet about having sexually functioning and gratifying relationships. Mm -hmm. And yet and still, we still hold on tight to this garbage and we're just making, perpetuating the cycle. What is it, what are some things that we can do to kind of just like break that cycle? Even if it's just, it helps just a few people okay and not the society overall yeah so um there's a there's, <laughs> no pressure it, it's a big question um but, <laughs> but if i if what i was to like three things like was two to three um so there, there's three things so one okay. is you know we have to commit to believing survivors and victims when they come forward okay. so you know when someone comes to you confused or concerned with a particular interaction that they may have had with their spouse or non-spouse, uh, instead of questioning their experience, believe them. Tell them that they're not alone, that there are professionals who can help. 
ask them what they need from you, right? Which is more, more often than not, just for you to listen and to hold that space. Um, number two, commit to speaking about sex and sexual abuse in a way that is open, free of blame and shame and across a lifespan. So we have to have to start these conversations in age appropriate ways as early as age three so that these issues become less stigmatized, more people know that it is normal and acceptable to get help. They know how to get help, who to reach out to. And I really appreciate you know, your commitment to your children about how you said, that was not a hadith that I taught my child. Now granted, they might have heard that from other places because you can't shut down you know, societal messaging, but you made a commitment that if, if it's not sitting well with me as a woman and gender and my commitment to gender equity, I'm not going to say husband, that. And my husband, I just want to put that out there. That's right. <laughs> in your family, if it's not <laughs> aligned, if it's not <laughs> aligned with your well. family values and your commitment to gender justice, then then don't teach your kid that. No matter how many people tell you that that's what Islamic knowledge is and that it's your duty to teach them that part of Islamic knowledge and stuff. If it's not sitting with you, if you think there's something wrong, chances are there's something wrong mm -hmm. with that, right? Chances are it's problematic. And then three, I, it's also about creating systems. I mean, we talked a lot about systems that don't support uh, safe disclosure and systems that don't support um, healing and justice and holding perpetrators accountable, right? Uh, too often, our victims end up actually seeking advice of their imam, of their mosque, of their mosque leadership, of you know people, of the aunties in the mosque or the uncles in the mosque. And more often than not, they're turned away, they're ignored, they're silenced. And so we need to actually, from a systems level, reduce the burden on the individual victim from disclosing and make it easier for people to report, make it easier for people to, to know that their anonymity and their privacy will be protected if they do report, make it easier for them to get help and also make it easier for abusers to be held accountable because too often they get away with it and then they end up targeting their next victim. Yeah, and abusers don't just stop abusing. Nope. Abusers do not stop abusing. And I also think, don't you have yeah. a fundraiser? Don't you have a fundraiser going on? Yes, we actually okay, do. Okay, so they, yeah. need to, they need to shell out some money to heart. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Because so you can- very it's very, very important. It is very, very important because often, too, too often, okay, um, victims feel like they they don't have a place to go, and it can be very, very cultural specific, and it can be based on faith as well. And you can be a victim and 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 feel like you don't want to go to certain organizations. Maybe those organizations may not be for you. Sometimes those organizations re-victimize if there's no cultural competency competency within them. And so we need to have spaces where, because this is a dean, because this is a way of life, when I go for help and for assistance, that person will respect that. That person will understand that. That person will talk to me in a way that's culturally specific so that I can start to process what's happening to me, start the, pro start the process of healing, utilizing the, the faith as well. So I think that heart is very, very important. You know, there's stuff that I've read, okay, over the years that kind of, it really stuck to me when I've heard you say it, or when I heard, you know, or when I heard Sahar say it, or one of the videos or reading it or something like that. Like it sticks even hard, it stuck even harder with me. So even though I knew it, just by having it in that context of my faith as well, reinforced it in, in a way that was spiritually gratified as Thank well. You. So I think that the work is very, very important. So where can people donate? Yeah, so we have a, a number of ways that you can donate. So first and foremost, you can donate on our website, www.heartwomenandgirls.org slash donate. Uh, we uh, have one-time options and monthly options. We also take uh, accept zakat if you want your donation to count towards zakat. Uh, we also have a Facebook fundraiser right now. Uh, going on that you can find on our actual Facebook page. Uh, so you can uh, donate that way as well. So those are, I mean, there are more ways than that, but I think those are the two main ways that uh, would be great to donate. Okay. And does Hart have any kind of um, uh, training for lead leadership training when it comes to sexual abuse and violence? Yeah, actually, uh, so we are working uh, on uh, rolling out. Uh, we did a, like sort of a pilot earlier this year um, in a Midwest mosque, but we are training uh, religious leaders, imams, chaplains on um, 
on addressing uh, sexual misconduct and sexual violence, how to do that in a way that's safe, how to do that in a way that is victim centric, because that is first and foremost um, important, and how to do that, you know, whether it's alongside law enforcement or whether it's instead of law enforcement, how to think about which um, sort of uh, uh, professionals and uh, professionals really that and experts that you need to engage when actually doing this if you want to do it in a way that honors privacy honors anonymity and up, uplifts healing and justice so is okay so then on a communal level okay people Muslims in their community can encourage leadership to engage in this important yes. training so yes. they can approach their leaders and say, listen, this, you know, that this is something that's going on in, in the society. And we have a Muslim organization that is able to provide training so that our community members can then be safe and have spaces that when, if they, if they are, if they encounter any kind of violence at all, if they encounter any kind of problem, then they can go to the leadership and the leadership has the efficient training to, to help them and, and be a valuable resource to them instead of either re-victimizing them or reinforcing the trauma because they don't know what to do. Because I think that that's something that can be very traumatic as well because you've given so many examples. But I think another example is that, like you said, you go to the leadership, you go to your mom, because that's what you're trained to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a problem, let me go to my mom. But unfortunately, my mom doesn't have the training that I need because you know sexual violence is very, very serious. And so the, they, they haven't been trained. They've been trained in other things, mm -hmm. but they haven't been trained in that. And I also think that, you know, is that so I think that Muslims should really, really, in their community, encourage this type of training so that there is uh, uh, resources available in, on, the, on the communal level for when those things happen, especially since we said that abusers keep on abusing. They'll jump from community to community to community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you may think that it's safe in your community until that those abusers or that abuser decides to jump into your community, and then there you go. So I think that that's very, very important as well. I want to thank you so much, Jazakla Khair. Thank this you is so much wonderful. for having me. So wonderful. I, the one thing that I've decided to do is that I want you to put my girl Sahar on notice. <laughs> All right, okay, because I want to talk to her. And I'm ready to to do a Facebook live with her. So we're gonna get have to get that in motion. Yep. She does some really you guys do some really, really great work. And I really want to talk to her more about gendered Islamophobia and about trauma and everything like that. And Samira, she's not getting off scot free either. Yeah. <laughs> either. So I'm putting it live out there so that they know I'm coming looking for you guys too. <laughs> Inshallah. Jazakallah Khairan for joining me. Jazakallah, everyone. For, for listening, and inshallah, we'll have more to come from Heart Muslim Girls. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.